Hello, everybody. It's Monday, November 28th. Uh, Chapo coming at you. I uh, hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, let's let's get it rolling today. Um, uh, Felix, I've been uh, watching a lot of Law & Order SVU episodes recently. Because, uh, once again, you've, you've infected my, my mind with this. And luckily, it is on TV 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Yeah. Um, what period of SVU are you watching? Uh, like okay, like uh, the, the block that I got into yesterday was more of like season six, season eight. You know, like back when it, before Peter Scavino and any of the new. It's still Munch, Tutuola, Stabler, Benson, like the 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 classic golden age SVU. Yeah, like I mean, okay, so I can I, I put it into like two major eras. It's before Christopher Maloney left and after. Um, after Christopher Maloney left, um. They tried to replace his presence on the show with a uh, succession of pissed off detectives. <laughs> they famously had Detective Amaro, who's played by like uh, I would say a generic version of Bobby Cannavale, like one of those. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, like we the, walk it in. You're at yeah, the friggin' rest. Like a guy, like they all have a character who's like you know he's a detective, but his conflict is that he's too Latino, you know. <laughs> He gets too Latino in his marriage and at his work, and they're like, "Stop it, stop it! You're getting too Latino." Uh, and and then they bring not in the a, same. Uh, it's not the same as uh, Christopher Maloney. And then they bring um, in, uh, you know, Rollins, uh, the the hot blonde detective who has like a gambling addiction and uh, a bad father. Okay, so Rollins is ridiculous. Um, Rollins is they what they do for that character. They have this hot younger blonde detective who's like a shit kicker from Georgia. And instead of like giving her a back, like as much of a backstory as Olivia, what they do is like every week she like almost gets like raped to death by bookies <laughs> because she has a gambling addiction or she like does something that that should get her fired as a cop, but like doesn't. I mean, didn't they introduce her character by um, she's basically uh, she ends up having sex with a guy who's a criminal played by Donal Long, who's actually an undercover detective. Yeah, sort of like yeah. to keep his cover, he has sex with a police officer, and then um, that you know pseudo sexual assault becomes the genesis of their relationship on the show. Like yeah, they, they fall in love with each other. But that's like that's in between her having an on again off again thing with D Detective Latino, who oh, okay. also like. Her, they do the same thing with her and Amaro, which is like they fire them and then bring them back every other week because they keep they keep doing insane things like yeah, going undercover without telling anybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I was it, just it, watching the uh, like the the, the more clad the Golden Age S S S V U, and I gotta say my favorite episodes are the ones that deal with like privileged New York City private school kids and like sex panics. I, I, there was literally one about uh, rainbow parties and yes. like sex bracelets. And there's one, just any episode where it's like online or chat rooms lead to an outbreak of HIV among thousands of uh, high school students in New York, including uh, the risk that Stabler's daughter may have been exposed. Those are really good. I like it when um, this is like later in the Stabler period where they're like, OK, we got a plot twist. Stabler's daughter she has the bad woman disease. <laughs> yes. She has, yes. she has woman <laughs> madness. <laughs> no, she, the, the she has a, yeah, the crime. Stabler woman is disorder. such a bad father. His, his <laughs> daughter, be terrible. his daughter becomes a whore and his son is like, fuck you, dad. I'm joining the army. Yeah. Can't be under your roof. And he's like, I'll always love you, son. I'm not signing your induction papers. Yeah. You can, the difference between the two eras of law and order, in my opinion, are like, okay, in the golden era, it, every episode starts out the same. It's like a little like New York vignette, right? It's yeah. like it, it's like uh, two like you know just tri-state boobs moving a refrigerator, and they're like, "Oh, I'm thinking about going to the strip club this weekend." <laughs> and the other one goes, "You, you're you're full of it. You, I bet you think those girls really like you." And then they like one of them trips, and he's like, "Hey, watch where you're going. This lady's gonna have our ass." And he trips over like the most desecrated corpse ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then the SVU detectives are there. But after after Stabler leaves and after they get a bigger budget, they change it. They make it like less New York-y. And what happens is they'll show you like little vignettes. Uh, it'll be like a girl growing up and falling in love and like getting a yes. career. Yes. And then it will immediately cut to her like just like 
a, no, yeah, a desecrated corpse and Olivia Benson going, this is the most ejaculated on body I've seen this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, Felix, I, I, Catherine and I were watching one of the, the very, like the newer ones, like the post-COVID SVU the other day. And the cold open was so bad, we had to stop watching it. Because it was just like, yeah, it was this like, the cold open encompasses like the year of COVID. And it's this woman who like owns a restaurant. And it's just like, oh, like... They're, 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 they're banging pots and pans together for carers. And I was like, oh, is this a rip from the headlines episode about my wife sucked off neighbors while I clapped for carers? No, <laughs> it was just this like, you know, montage of this woman's life and like how hard it was to be, uh, you know, uh, in New York City during COVID. And then she's like going to lose her restaurant. And then it's just like, oh, she like takes the building inspector hostage. And I'm like, this isn't a special victim. Sucked, Where are dude. the victims? Because they like all the guys who used to write for that show. That show was perfect because it was written by like. 89 year olds who wrote every episode of like homicide or new york undercover so they could write like a perfectly self-contained like hour-long cop story and like just write really fun tri-state goblin characters but then <laughs> after those guys like presumably died of old age they bring in people who you know got master's degrees in tv and they're like oh we should actually um i was thinking uh we should we should actually make it sort of like la dolce vita in the three minute intro before we show the woman's <laughs> ejaculated on beheaded corpse. <laughs> no, the classic one, we were like, the, the classic one, like the teen sex panic one, began with, uh, you know, classic New York City thing, a troop of Boy Scouts on the top of a building uh, looking at constellations through telescopes. And then like, uh, then, then two of them are like doing, you know, they they move the telescope down and they're like, check this out. You know, like well, there's, a, there's a babe in one of these windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then like, and then, like the, the, the scout leader is like, what are you doing? You got to look at the sky. And then they're like, oh, I don't think she's moving. And it's just a body on a rooftop. <laughs> yeah, those are those are great. And the, yeah. And then in that episode, it was like like high school girls who are like, OK, first it starts off about like, oh, they're hooking up. And kids don't date anymore because they're just having blowjob parties. And then very like from one commercial break later, it's like she was a underage porn star with HIV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are really that's like my I have like favorite tropes of the series and the tropes go on even after the series had a decline after Stabler left. Um, but OK, like when they investigate school kids and it turns out, yeah, like a 14 year old has seven kids and is a porn <laughs> actress and like is a hooker on the weekends. Um, I love that. I love, um, I love when there's a totally normal guy and they get his DNA on like nine murders and then the twist and it's not a twist anymore. Cause they've done this approximately 37 times. The guy, it turns out the guy had a secret son or twin brother who got the rapist gene. <laughs> he's normal but he has someone who's genetically identical to him who got the killer gene they they uh, love doing that one okay uh, there's another one we watched where it was like okay it, it it begins and and they're doing one of those like you know sort of puppet presentations for like um young children about like inappropriate touching and you know like the puppets say like hey what do you do if someone touches you in an unsafe space and then they're like and then after the uh the little like school assembly um they like have an opportunity for the kids to like you know like ask them questions or talk to them one-on-one -on -one. and then like one of the little kids is like i like you know i touched weenies with someone and they're like yeah okay we gotta get we gotta get stabler in here and then they bring the mom in they bring the mom in and they're like they're like okay like i'm sorry ma'am but like your child has made an allegation that he's been sexually abused and the mother goes not again and it's just like her other kid was abused by her father. And then, and then the son that was abused is now abusing his younger brother. And if that's not bad enough, he's abusing his younger brother. But like as a 14 or 15 year old has set up some sort of dark web live streaming yeah. account where he rapes his brother for like a network of what? thousands of pedophiles. Yeah, yes, no, yes, Matt, yes. there's so many. Matt, in like 2007, they did like 50 episodes where it's like, Damn, not only is he doing child porn, it's gone viral. 35,000 <laughs> views. <laughs> They're like, he gets home from volleyball practice and he starts streaming child porn. <laughs> He's going viral on the child porn net. <laughs> the name of the website was Timmy's Treehouse. <laughs> Yeah, all the like all like in in 2007 when they find out about like dark web and shit. 
like according to them, half of all websites are like live streamed, like ritual child yeah, snuff abuse. films and, and, yeah. and rape. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and um, every time like it, it'll always be like they do a lot of that where it's like a teenager is like abusing children, and he always like he runs off, and Kragen, the Dan Florek captain character, always yeah. like sides kill. Yeah, sides king Dan Florek always says like a hilarious antiquated thing. He's like. All right, people, we found him. Now we lost him. Let's viral him. <laughs> Let's make him viral on the Internet so everyone knows what he looks like. We got to oh. trend, trend him up. We got to trend it. Yeah. yeah, let's put him on Metafilter, everybody. <laughs> everybody, get on Dig. Redig this. <laughs> fark, fark this content. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, email low tax. <laughs> Season season twenty eight of Law and Order SVU is dedicated to the memory of Richard Lotax <laughs> So you 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 you're telling you're telling me people pay ten dollars to register and then another ten dollars to search? I can search on Google. Uh, what a good show! What the hell? What the hell is the Pink Forum? <laughs> oh, ah. It's the best show ever made. Yeah, Look, it's there great. there is. There are there's going to be at least one SVU centered episode in the near future. Um, look forward to that. Um, and I don't know. I don't even want to tease the other thing that for that another podcast is doing. Uh, it, it's very exciting, but a lot of SVU content coming down the pipeline. I mean, SVU might be one of the single most important uh, television shows of the 21st century because it absolutely it is predates. It predates and sets the stages for the true crime uh, explosion. Like absolutely, true crime yes. Popular culture. One of the tributaries there, main ones, is SVU. It's like that's what nourishes the soil where all those podcasts spring up later. Yeah, it like it's interesting because like okay, Will brought up like the moral sex panic episodes, right? That's how like suburbanites got freaked out about this shit before yep. everyone yep. was on the computer all the time. Was that like, yeah, you'd see it on an episode of SCU or like maybe a chain email or something like that. Or I remember actually, I remember my parents were like very resistant to like most moral panics of the nineties and two thousands. They were very like m media literate people and like resistant to that sort of thing. But even they, like I remember telling me one time when I was like nine, they were like, we just heard this news report on on NPR. Apparently, suburban girls are joining the Bloods gang and getting sexed in. <laughs> and like, like they were dead, like they were smart enough to like avoid most of those. But if you're constantly like bombarded with that, where it's like targeted at you, like affluent parents, it's targeted at you to be afraid all the time. Even if you, even if you resist all the other ones, you're gonna hear one that's gonna like you're gonna go, oh, that's totally true. That's happening to everyone. That's oh, yeah. probably happening in our, our, our block. Yeah. It's definitely happening in the parking lot, which yeah. is the only public space these people encounter in their lives. So of course it's where they're going to get you because they're being conditioned to be terrified of any place that has not been uh, privatized and that like, yeah. they have some sort of, that there's some sort of pri private power presiding over because they've lost all faith in like any public sphere. It's just yeah, a, a den of weirdos and vans with uh, little zip ties they're going to put on your door handle to mark it later. So you'll slow down when you come to open the door. Like you don't have to slow down to open the fucking door. What? Well, this is a uh, perfect segue into uh, one of the articles I wanted to discuss today. As long as we're talking about um, uh, frightened suburbanites and their overwhelming sense of loneliness leading to a, an apocalyptic view of the world. Uh, this is from the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the New York Times uh, just yesterday, it's a headline is meet the voters who fueled New York's seismic tilt toward the GOP. Republicans use doomsday style ads to capitalize on suburban voters fear of crime in New York, helping to flip enough seats to capture the House. And, you know, we've talked about this before, but like uh, the Times does give a, uh, you know, sort of it, it paints a portrait of a lot of the uh, like uh, Felix, as you described, the. Uh, the the Mucinex monsters who chant crime crime crime, uh, these are like this is the Long Island New York Republican, like the, the Lee Zeldin voter, and I just want to read a few things from here today. 
says, uh, New York and its suburbs may remain among the safest large communities in the country, yet amid a torrent of doomsday-style advertising and constant media headlines about rising crime and deter- ter- deteriorating public safety, suburban swing voters like Ms. Frankel helped drive a Republican route that played a decisive role in tipping control of the House. Uh, one thing I'll say about that is uh, like, I'm, I'm, it played a role, but it, this is the New York Times covering New York state politics. The fact that it didn't mention Cuomo's uh, redistricting of the state uh, as a, as a, as a you know, I don't know, like an, another factor in tipping control to the Republicans of the, in the House is rather telling. But there's some good uh, interviews with um, basically extras from Law & Order SVU here. <laughs> It says here, uh, several, including Ms. Frankel, said they frequently read the New York Post, which made Mr. Zeldin's candidacy for governor and the repeal of the state's 2019 bail law a crusade for more than a year, splashing violent crime across its front page, however rare they still may be. Many asked not to be identified by their full names out of fear of backlash from friends, colleagues, or even strangers who could identify them online. I wouldn't go into the city even if they paid me, a retired dental hygienist said as she mailed a letter in Oyster Bay. A 41-year-old lawyer from Rockville Center said she sometimes wondered if she would make it home at night alive. A financial (laughs) advisor from North Salem in Westchester County said it felt like the worst days of the 1980s and 1990s had returned, despite the fact that crime rates remain a fraction of what they were then. I have kids who live in Manhattan, and I'm every day I'm scared. Lisa Greco, an empty nester who voted all Republicans said as she waited at a nail salon in Pleasantville in Westchester. I don't want them taking the subways, but of course they do, she continued. I I actually track them because I have to know every day that they're back home. Like, I don't want to keep texting them like, are you at work? Are you here? Totally normal. Totally normal way to be. Just completely uh, Julianne Morden safe. But for the news... (laughs) That is a completely regular relationship with the world and its dangers. Yeah. But the thing is, the one, the, what the guy says in there was, it's like the 80s. Of course, you can nerdly say, uh, actually, crime is much lower than it was in the 80s. But the thing is, in the 80s, people were responding to, people were processing like those crime rates in social conditions where they talked to other people in a day, where they had social relationships, like spent time in, in talking and interact with other people. Hey, you hear about Steve getting mugged or whatever coming out the subway? That's how you would, that's the context for that crime. Now, even though crime is much lower, we've replaced that social interaction with internet, with media. Yeah. And so it's like all day your friends are telling you, hey, you hear about Steve getting a, a pickpocketed? You hear about Dave the knockout game? It's that's every, if you heard that, if that's all you heard in like 1982, you would go insane. You turn into the Punisher. If every person you talk to in a day talk to you about violent crime instead of, you know, the handful of conversations you might have in a week that kind of form your understanding of how bad crime is in, in when you were talking to real humans, you just get this klaxon nonstop. And it's but it's the same social reality. How, what else are you supposed to compare it to? It's it's right. real to you. That is as bad as it is in New York. Right, right. And I, I do think a, another small thing in the, in that uh, paragraph was interesting how they talked about how they read the New York Post. And these are presumably people who wouldn't have read the Post a lot otherwise, right? Yeah. Because the Post is like, you know, I, I read the Post from time to time. Besides having hilarious headlines. They got the um, best headlines in the game. They, the best. They're, they're the best. Um, they actually, they didn't use my suggestion for when Ron DeSantis won, which was going to be Chris fails to rise again. <laughs> <laughs> but um great headlines but it's also like it's it's um if you want to read about crimes that's the best paper in new york oh yeah you Crime know Central. well i mean the thing i the thing i noticed in this is that they're they're clearly like um it's the new york times so they they make sure to to mention and i'm sure not inauthentically that uh, the new york post is the uh paper of record for uh long island uh you know crime heads out there but i gotta say it's pretty rich coming from the new york times because like they spent the last year and a half pushing the exact same message just with boring headlines for a liberal readership not a conservative right right right. um but i mean okay the new york the new york times does report on individual crimes but like if you want like a crime blotter you can read the new york post and my point was my point was that like okay in general I do think that like a lot of the focus on crime is, as Matt said, a reflection of like media consumption conditions and that, you know, the feeling that crime is worse than ever is obviously a media creation. 
that said, it's still like not a non-existent problem. No, it's a real phenomenon. Right. It's a real it's a real thing that exists. And OK, like there has to be some way to talk about crime that isn't like either the New York Post, like get rid of the sickos thing or the New York Times version of it, where it's like get rid of the sickos, but don't feel good doing it. There has to be some way where you can acknowledge that it's a reality that that exists where you're still not like where you're still not demanding that you put like 17 year olds in prison for life for armed robbery. Well, the problem is, is that even if you're the New York Times and you really are filled with that desire to honestly report what's going on with crime in the city, you aren't. You actually have listened to citations needed and you do want to make like you want to be uh, honest and you want to uh, uh, affirm the truth. You still are reporting things, right? You can report on individual crimes or you can report on stories around crime. And in New York, the only stories around crime are Republicans saying it's out of control and then Democrats saying it's out of control. What are you right. supposed to say as the New York Times? Those right. are the only polls. Where else is it? Right. Who else is acting in a way for them to shape the news around? That's it. Those are the two polls. And that's because the Democratic Party in New York is just just awful, corrupt scumbag association it's just tammany hall blown up where they don't even have the fellow feeling because they don't hang around and smoke cigars anymore they're on zoom calls with their babysitters (laughs) a tammany hall no one gets a turkey every year yeah right and there and there's no like if those are your only options there is no policy beyond yeah beyond beyond like oh we're gonna give like more money to cops without even any any uh, requirements for where it goes, what type of training they're just going to buy Israeli military runoff or, you know, something even worse. I mean, there's just there there is no policy because there I mean, OK, if you look at not like oh, there's more sickos on the subway or whatever like that, like if you look at like crime in Chicago or crime in like Memphis, crime in places that have did have like a huge spike in murders, very localized to like specific neighborhoods in 2020. There's like no real policy that you can actually do that would permanently or at least meaningfully impact anything besides like a a massive reorganization of society and its resources. Yes. And it would take years and years and probably decades because the conditions there are a reflection of of that, of like a fundamentally broken society and people who interpret and correctly so that they're at war yes and uh the same way that they can't address it without undermining you know the conditions that create crime they also can't address the conditions that create the thing that a lot of people especially people who live in cities as opposed to in suburbs are actually upset about which is visible poverty yes right right. also load-bearing also non-negotiable right i also feel like your point about new york city though and like visible poverty i think another huge thing uh, that I've that I I and many other people have noticed about like uh, the people's perception of crime being out of control is all of the complaints that like everywhere in New York City smells like weed now, which yeah. is it legal. Always, New York is which is legal, bad. but like I got I got news for you, it smelled like weed before it was legal. New York New York has always smelled like something bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, it always. It's like oh but, yeah, oh I, I'm so pissed it smells like weed here. It's really covering up the urine. I would much right. rather be smelling that. Get out of here. Right. And okay, like to that end, visible poverty, there's no acknowledgement that these are two separate issues. These are two separate types of crime. Right. There is the actual murder spike that happened. And then there is the complaints about crime in places like New York and L.A., which at the end of the day is mostly just complaining that you see homeless people. Because the spike in murder... The spike in murder happened everywhere. Right. And the spike right. in murder is worse in rural areas than it is in urban areas as like as ratios. And like there's cities like uh, Jacksonville, Florida, which are completely controlled by Republicans that have vastly higher crime rates than any of these coastal cities. But well, well, well Jackson, Jacksonville has like it, it has a murder problem that is identical to some neighborhoods in Chicago and some places in New York and some like it's the same thing. It's the same type of thing where. If you took out all of these neighborhoods, they would be placed. They're all almost all to the exact place, like places that used to be like solidly middle class or like working like lower middle class places that were pretty safe, good places to live. Deindustrialization happened. Yep. The mass degradation of Americans happened. Uh, uh, the destruction of 
the safety net, everything happens and they are as they are now. But like, you know, these are like crime is generalized as a singular issue, but that is those are two completely separate things. I'd like to uh, like uh, a segue into an issue that I think very much uh, informs this conversation in terms of people's media consumption and people's perceptions about the world at large. And that is a, a number of uh, news articles uh, that came out over the weekend uh, that tally up with frightening detail the extent to which Americans across every single racial, gender, and class line are more alone than they've ever been. Yeah. Before we get to that, I, I do want to talk about like the homeless thing a little bit because I do, I, I don't know. I think that's interesting too, because that's, that's another thing where there's just almost no answer to it, where no one really yeah. presents an answer. It's just, it's the same like shitty. Move it around. And, right. It's the same like kicking the can and shitty back and forth that we've seen for years. It's like one group of people that has like an insane psychotic reaction to just like seeing a homeless person at all. And then, then a reaction to it that has been unbeknownst by the people saying it just moved so far beyond any policy that it's just making fun of those people for being freaked out. Yeah. It's like, like, like we, we've talked about this before, how like a lot of, uh, a lot of like homeless policy, it's been moved so far to the right because, you know, what was once there should be housing for these people becomes like, oh, well, I think these people should be able to sleep on the sidewalk without there being spikes put down. Right. I don't think because, there should be a law against them eating out of the garbage. Because if there's no solution to these problems, then the only question politically for me as a, as a well-off person in the cities is how am I going to uh, feel about this? And so it becomes another virtue to hoard. Ooh. Right. Yes. Keep them around so that I can feel superior because I can say it doesn't bother me. Right. And I do, I do want to say that, like, well, you know, while I do think that, like, a lot of this where people just, like, see a homeless person at all, like, they see a tent and they start getting freaked out. I think that's insane. I do sympathize, like, with the idea of, like, yeah, being a woman on a subway at night and there's a guy who's, like, severely mentally ill from being forced to live outside for 20 years. That probably is scary. A lot of it probably is scary. And it is a fucking terrible situation. But again, it's another one of those things where, like, we're so far removed from any solution outside of, like, authorize the cops to just shoot them all and yeah. throw their bodies into a mass grave. Yes. But to the to, to the point about uh, loneliness, I just want, I just want to highlight uh, a few of these things in these news articles. Um, uh, one of them says, like, uh, just basically a headline, Americans 15 and older are spending a lot more time alone than they did in 2013. The trend started before the pandemic, but it seems unquestionable, unquestionable that the pandemic, like, supercharged a phenomenon that was already beginning to trend in that direction. Uh, it says, according to the Census Bureau's American Time Use Survey, the amount of time the average American spent with friends was stable at six and a half hours per week between 2010 and 2013. Then in 2014, time spent with friends began to decline. By 2019, the average American was spending only four hours per week with friends, a sharp 37 percent decline from five years before. COVID then deepened the trend. During the pandemic, time with friends fell further. In 2021, the average American spent only two hours and 45 minutes a week with close friends, a 58% decline relative to 2010 and 2013. No single group drives this trend. Men and women, white and non-white, rich and poor, urban and rural, married and unmarried, parents and non-parents all saw proportionately similar declines in time spent with others. Yeah, I got to say, like, out of out of the many alarming trends in our society today, uh, this is one of the most disturbing to me. The uh, the isolation and loneliness and people sort of uh, dropping out from spending time with friends, spending time with other people, being around other people. And I think um, what that does to people psychologically is whether they're aware of it or not, creates a feeling of a tremendous um, fear and uh, insecurity in your and uh, around yourself so that like that the, the, what you are spending your active time uh your free time doing is i don't know yeah like being on the internet and like i said whether it's crime or or or, or any other thing it just it, i think it people are social animals and being alone is frightening being being alone it, it like you're you are weaker when you are alone than if you are 
you know, embedded in kind of like, you know, friends, family, a community, or that like, you know, people who you spend your free time with having fun or just talking or relating to other people, being around other people. And I think it makes people much more easily frightened. And I think it makes them feel, yeah, like, like the, the world is coming to an end. Because in a sense, it is. If like you're not spending Indeed. time with any other people. Yeah, that is the literal end of humanity. It's the end of the most meaningful thing, the basis for why we're a special animal. And it is what the speaking of our last uh, week's episode, that is what our rulers are consciously seeking. A world where they are just a one consciousness in a tube, amusing themselves eternally, and no other person is worthy of any reciprocal relationship. It's like replacing all reciprocal ties between humans with technology, so that you are just an uh, an encased consciousness eternally, and then you get to rule over us as we just destroy ourselves. Uh, what because we still have some humanity to try to save her. And uh, we have nothing to do but act out, which is why we're seeing all this stuff getting worse and worse and all of our responses to it being channeled into the dumbest, most counterproductive uh, ways and the, the passions, because we don't have any guide. We have no idea other than what our media consumption is telling us, which is just a fucking mirror to our own neuroses. Uh, I saw I saw a post this morning that I thought uh, uh <laughs> Uh, very uncannily sum this uh, sum this all up. This is by a guy named Alexander Wang, who is of course a uh, a CEO at a company that deals with artificial intelligence. Uh, his comment this morning was: the real problem with other cities, L.A., New York City, Miami, relative to San Francisco, is that people are severely over socialized. You need time alone to think, reflect, and build plans to do anything important. In L.A., NYC, Miami, the constant solar social roller coaster steamrolls all individual thought. Um, that is, um, if T-800 is going to go back in time and stop anyone, I think it's the author of that post. <laughs> uh, levels of eye contact in New York and L.A. are dangerously high. Oh, man, everyone is socializing so much across the country. It's, it's absurd. <laughs> People are hanging out with each other so much. Thank God you can go to San Francisco where... No one has any interaction with anybody else. Well, I mean, like to your, to your point, Matt, about how like this all serves the uh, the designs of our uh, vampiric uh, overlords uh, quite nicely is because the idea is like, no, like time that you're spending socializing is not time is time that you're not being productive. Yes, it's time that you're not working to build important things and to you know, focus on uh, important tasks and thoughts to have any unalienated human values or experiences or connections of any kind. And, I mean, a populace that has relationships with each other, that knows each other and talks to each other, is the most dangerous thing politically. Yes. Any, ty any, ty any type of, like, massive formation of people who are all fighting for each other's interests, it, the very thing that is almost impossible right now with methods of communication and media consumption habits, that is the most dangerous thing. Can't have it. Get everybody Can't have it. Working Can't have it. Commiserating. Can't have it. Keep commiserating. Talking to each other. <laughs> Can't have it. <laughs> Look, this is what it is. You know, we all. You're going to do what you're going to do. Um, uh, one more thing about um, <laughs> evidence of severe social rot. Uh, Felix, I saw you share this story uh, just like an hour before we started recording the show, and I, I started reading it and was absolutely aghast. This is the New Yorker article about how hospice care has been like supercharged into this billion dollar industry by essentially like door to door salesing people on the on dying. Yeah, I thought this was <laughs> I thought this was insane, obviously, but it did. OK, we're, we're going to get into this a little bit, but just to give you the broad strokes, it, it basically for profit hospices, which another another monstrous thing in our healthcare system that should not exist. They they are because, you know, it's a tough business. You, you constantly need people who are dying. So how do you solve that problem? <laughs> yeah, you like tell people you 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 treat people who aren't dying. You tell them they are dying or maybe you just tell the insurance company that they're dying. Uh, one thing that this did make me think uh, getting more conspiratorial is, OK, the, the massive trend online of self-diagnosis there's always been a huge thing of self-diagnosis online. Uh, it was usually a thing for like the most online, the most the most dedicated keyboard uh, keyboard warriors in the world. It's the th it's the thing you do when you have just 
forsake in real life. But now, like most things that were big for like the biggest computer users in 2012, everyone does it now. Everyone self-diagnoses. Yep. And I mean, okay, if I'm running a for-profit healthcare system that needs people to buy things that they don't need medically, that would be that would be incredible for me. I would love that. If people are constantly telling each other and themselves that they have diseases that they don't have. And you know, like and, and hospice care is a particularly ghoulish example of this because as you alluded to, Felix, uh, how do you have a uh, a for profit model on providing care for people who are dying when um, as soon as they need it, they're going to die very soon, <laughs> very shortly right. after the, the services are engaged? So I just want to read from the beginning of this article. Over the years, Marsha Farmer had learned what to look for as she drove the back roads of rural Alabama. She kept an eye out for dilapidated homes and trailers with wheelchair ramps. Some days she'd ride the one-car ferry across the river to Lower Peachtree and other secluded hamlets where a, ha- where a few houses lacked running water and bare soil was visible beneath the floorboards. Other times she'd scan church prayer lists for the names of families with ailing members. Farmer was selling hospice, which strictly speaking is for the dying. To qualify, patients must agree to forego curative care and be certified by doctors as having less than six months to live. But at Acer- Care, a national chain where Farmer worked, she solicited recruits regardless of whether they were near death. She canvassed birthday parties at housing projects and went door-to-door promoting the program to loggers and textile workers. She sent colleagues to cadge rides on the Meals on Wheels van or to chat up veterans at the American Legion bar. We'd find rundown places where people were more on the poverty line, she told me. You're looking for uneducated people, if you will, because you're able to provide something for them and meet a need. This is like, hey, like, like, you know, I need the Glengarry leads on people who are dying or who think they're dying. Well, listen, what can I get you to do to forsake curative care? What can I get you? Wait, what? Look, I'm going to put you in hospice care right now. Let's do a deal. What can I take to get you some hospice right now? But just the idea of like, uh, trolling, uh, like just evident. We talk about visible poverty, just trolling for like people at the fucking like margins of society. Is if they're not dying now, they're like, well, it's a pretty good chance they're gonna be soon. So let's just let's just get them in, get them in now. Sign, sign, uh, let's get them to sign on the line that is dotted. Yeah, they're really pretty scraping to the bottom of the barrel here. Uh, really trying to get that uh, profit hen- engine anywhere that's left. Any like, yeah, uh, hey, you know that. Uh, communal experience of gathering your loved ones around you and you know moving towards uh, a, a good death uh where can we wet our beak there yeah how can we get in there <laughs> you know you know uh you know when you talk about like creating something beyond an american nhs and nationalizing every step of production and care mm. and people always say where wh- what what are you going to do for people who work in the current industry what are you going to do about their jobs Keep in mind, these are the jobs they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The lady Get who's a new fucking for job. Chairs. Yes. No. Like, yeah, there should be a bit more productive care. use of that work. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It's funny. Like the, the creative destruction of the market never seems to apply to the rent seeking vampires in the uh, privatized health insurance industry. And Felix, your comment on this uh, is, is exactly right. These people's jobs, their wealth and their control over the system needs to be taken away by force. Yeah. W- no, without I, any remuneration for them. Just taken away from them. The, yeah. like, no, America cannot exist as a country with any kind of privatized health insurance system. Top to bottom. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit whether it is, you know, this woman whose job is, yeah, cruising for dying or people who may be dying soon or definitely dying after she gets in contact with them or, you know, someone in the, someone in the middle rungs of a health insurance company whose job is to tell people, that a CAT scan or chemotherapy isn't covered. I don't care. I don't care. Look, if 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 it's like a job that pays forty seven thousand dollars a year, I'm sure there's a bureaucratic job in the American NHS that they could fill. If they are if they are making four hundred thousand dollars a year off this, I they should be lucky that we don't put them in prison if that happens. I don't give a shit. I don't fucking care. No one ever no one ever cries like this for coal miners or anyone else. Nope. Just the uh, yeah, a, a lot of vivid examples of uh, social decay on uh, today's episode. But you know what? Let's uh, let's uh, finish out today's episode. Uh, you know, 
I'm I'm tired of talking about Elon Musk. We've talked about it too often. I just I, I feel that that well has run dry until he you know until the next stupid thing happens. But I thought we would uh, close out today's episode with a, a few listener questions, listener sourced questions, and just uh, have some fun and just uh, it's, it's, see what see what our listeners are coming up with uh, from for the Chapo sounding board for advice, thoughts, comments, and concerns. Uh, all right, let's see if this will work. Let me know if you guys can hear this. Hello, Chapo. I was recently yes. informed by a very drunk old man on the streets of Osaka, Japan, that my apartment is located about two blocks away from an Aikido dojo owned by Steven Seagal and operated by his son. Uh, I have been able to confirm that this is correct. Should I begin studying the way of Aikido? What do y'all think? Uh, you know, you will be uh, human trafficked. You will have your organs <laughs> harvested. Do not do this. You're going to go in there for some sparring and you're going to wake up in a fucking bathtub full with ice cubes in Moldova on a fucking steamship. I disagree with Matt. I'm saying if you have if, if if you just discovered that you were that close to an Aikido master and have the opportunity to train in the way of Aikido with Steven Seagal and his, and or his son, how could you not take advantage of that? If it, it, oh. If you, uh, you know, uh, I've got an apartment in uh, Renaissance Italy and Leonardo da Vinci was giving classes next door to you. You're telling me you wouldn't you wouldn't take a, you wouldn't you wouldn't check in. You wouldn't want to see what was on offer. Take the Aikido class and you can learn all of the fighting techniques um, for uh, disarming an opponent while you're sitting in a chair. OK, right. fine. Um, I, I, I think only only do this if you are prepared for the rest of your life to become a human weapon. Someone who as Will said, is more dangerous sitting down and staying seated for 12, 13, 14 hours at a time than most people ever will standing. Only do this if, you know, for the rest of your life, you want to wear safety goggles and the world's biggest leather jacket. And every time you meet an alarmingly younger woman, you save her from slavery. And you get to have full penetration sex without removing your hat, goggles, jacket, <laughs> pants, uh, a keto belt, a keto boots, a uh, tactical walking cane, <laughs> or, 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 or taking the Yoohoo out of your pocket. Only See, do that if you're prepared for that life. All right. That's what they're going to sell you on it. But you're going to go in there for one, one session, and then you're going to black out. You're going to wake up being parachuted over Kiev with a knife between your teeth <laughs> and orders to kill Zelensky. Okay. You may, well, that, well, is possible. That. that is possible. Okay. You may be tasked to fight with an army that is losing to the Ukrainian Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> that may be what happens to you. <laughs> Damn. Oh, Putin, uh, BTFO. Well, yeah. uh, speak, well, speaking of Putin, well, speaking of Putin and Steven Seagal, uh, listener, if if we haven't sold you on joining Steven Seagal's Aikido Dojo, then please do yourself a favor. Go over and over to YouTube and search up Steven Seagal Russian Martial Arts uh, Exposition, and you will see He's you will blur. see some of the some of the finest examples of of elite martial art performance ever ever captured on film. Just it's waves just like, after waves of opponents, he dispatches <laughs> yeah. with ease. The it, fastest, it almost looks too easy. <laughs> I would say the fastest human I've ever seen. <laughs> it's probably. amazing. It's so fast that it almost looks like he's not moving at all. Yeah, do it like that. Like he's doing nothing. Yeah, just standing there. Yeah, like you know, it, it, it's a fun, it's a it's a very advanced form of martial arts where if you just sort of um stand there slightly slouched with a gormless look on your face. Wave after wave of opponents will run at you, and then as soon as they make contact with your body, it will just sort of crumple like toilet paper. They'll just fall yeah. to the ground as you, as you sort of like limply wave your arm at them. I mean, that, yep. that's, what it, that's what it would appear like to the untrained eye, but with a <laughs> keto training, <laughs> you will realize, yeah, you will realize the, the mastery of the way of the couch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next question. All right, this one's uh, a little general, but I figure with the uh, World Cup on, it might... Uh, Bloody footy, mate. All right, here we it's go. It's going home. <laughs> hey, not sure if you answered this question before, but what do you think the connection between sports and politics is, if there is one at all? Thanks. None. They're the same thing. They're teams <laughs> to root for. Wow. That's it. You, yeah, could you be a little less specific, listener? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I need something to, to sink my teeth into here. Uh, well, the connection between sports and politics, I don't know. It's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they say that, um, you know, uh, war is just politics by other means. Well, you know, uh, politics is just sports by other means. By it's basically means. robot jocks, yeah. if you've ever seen that film. Um, where the, it's, the, it's the far future, and uh, uh, because of the mu- mutual uh, assured destruction, there's no more wars. Instead, countries uh, settle their differences with guys in giant mech suits punching each other. I mean, that's, that sounds good to me. I mean, that's, I, the yeah. World Cup would be a lot better if there were robots involved in it. And if, it, and if the, the match is determined geopolitical <laughs> questions. USA-Iran tomorrow. Like, okay. And, and dude, we got dude, sank. I, Can they get a nuke they, or not? If, if yeah, Iran that, wins, that they should get a nuke. So, that game would be so much more fun to watch if it would determine yes. whether Iran can have a nuclear yes. weapon or not. Yes. I think we should all honor that. And that would make sports and politics finally come back together as one thing and we can all just chill and let the robots d- pack us into uh herring crates well no no not, not just robots these are these are these are robots with human beings at the control of it it still comes down to the will and talent of the individual robot athlete or the robot driving athlete i mean i would say like uh, just further along on this thought like Sports are a necessary uh, sort of safety valve to unleash the pressure caused by politics because uh-huh. particularly among particularly among men and like, you know, strangers or someone you're meeting for the first time or the guy at the bar or like, you know, you're, you're meeting your girlfriend's parents or something like that. Politics, uh, you know, obviously that's a uh, it's a risky terrain to engage on if you care about it or you, you, you root for a political outcome. I think sports exists as a like a. A terrain of conversation and relation between men in our society that is like the baseline that anyone can engage in and have and and, and make small talk over. And yeah, there's competition involved, and you can you know uh, you can sort of uh, shit talk and you know like it, it, it provides a terrain of competition that um, is a stand-in for you know other forms of tribalism and competition in our society. But uh, it allows a safe kind of meaningless baseline of because you know like essentially it doesn't matter who wins or loses it's just something fun to talk about and invest your time in and uh yeah have a have a team you root for a very big part of it is second guessing uh we basically made our careers on that just like monday morning quarterbacking the democratic party for a while just like what look at what these <laughs> idiots are doing if if you put me if you gave me the headset Oh boy, I'd run a hell of a play. I'd do the statue. I'd do the annexation of Puerto Rico from Little Giants, and we'd win the fucking game. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the, Hakeem Jeffries needs to put some more fucking speed in the slots. I want to reiterate my uh, original point. I think there's zero intersection between politics <laughs> and sports. Um, you can infer zero things about capital, and next to nothing about culture, race relations, or gender. Uh, next question. Hello, Chapo boys. I am a human of the female variant, and I spend most of my time playing Valorant, hate watching late night shows, and listening to various so called leftist podcasts. I am at least a six, but I am still single. Every time I try to go on dates, I ruin them by getting drunk and talking about Cuba or explaining counter strafes. How does a lady like me land a fuckable man? Thanks, guys. I'll field this one. Oh yes, I've had se- I've, I, I've I've had sex, you know, depending on what sanctioning body, three quarters of one time or one point two five times in my life. <laughs> Look, men today, I'm I'm assuming I'm assuming that you are, you know, around 25, 24 years old. Me and myself, I'm a millennial. I'm forty nine years old. <laughs> Back in 2015, it was easier to have sex. People had not been as taken over by smartphones and apps. Um, Men today are more lonely, more cowed, more afraid of a forward woman. But if you are seeking not just sex, a meaningful relationship, it will end up in your life in the moment that you are looking for it the least. There will be a guy out there who is into a game that is significantly worse than Counter-Strike, significantly worse in every way, uh, worse to play, less fun, the skins aren't as cool, and uh, the movement sucks. He will not mind that you play Valorant instead of CSGO. He will be into politics. He may, Maybe he even went to Cuba. Um, that guy is out there. But this is just one of those things. When, you, when, you're, when you're spending all your time looking for it, that is when it won't show up. Spiritually, 
you know, I think literally you sound like a very nice, uh, nice woman. A lot of guys, I think, would be just jumping in line to date you. But spiritually, when you are looking for it, you are like uh, one of those guys who wears an Armani Exchange shirt in the club and is just trawling around for pussy, just walking with the Frankenstein walk with his mouth open and his <laughs> arms in front of him. And that is when it will, it will come to you the least. But be patient, be yourself, and soon you will raise, regrettably, two to three Valorant players. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, to, to reiterate what Felix said, I, I mean, I, I know this works if you're a guy looking to uh, uh, attract women, and, but I assume it, it, it may work in similar ways for a woman looking to attract a man. But the, the surest fire way to be attracted to the opposite sex is to, and it's very hard to reverse engineer this, but uh, it, it's to genuinely not care about being like uh, attracting another person or like just like you don't you don't need sex or romance or relationships the you don't Dow need of steve donald you're just, Lowe, you're, you're, up. you're just yourself and like that's ten that tends to be when it comes to you actually uh uh chris and i uh we went out last night went to a concert uh and it was like uh chris and molly and me and Catherine and uh one of uh chris and molly's friends and we were talking about like a like a along similar lines and uh some guy at the bar overheard our conversation sort of leaned in and I, I said, I think he put it quite nicely. He said, all romance is just fucking around and finding out. <laughs> so you gotta, Word. you gotta be will You gotta be willing to, um, uh, like to, to, to put your heart out there and risk it having be uh, destroyed. But like the true, the true Tao, like the way of the Bushido is to already meditate upon having your heart be destroyed in the first place. It's just to not care. If you think of yourself as already dead and call her one more point. Uh, you, I, I know you described yourself as a six. Don't sell yourself short. And in fact, don't rate anyone on a one to ten uh, scale of desirability. Chances are you're a lot higher than that. But also, all women are tens. Yeah. So, and I, I actually have a way more complex and nonlinear system for rating women. <laughs> <laughs> Non-Euclidean woman rating system. Yes. It involves, it involves calculus. Her number is damn irrational. <laughs> yeah. This girl has a cosin. Anyway, you, you sound like a wonderful femoid, and I'm sure there's a guy out there for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, next question? Yeah. Hello, Chapo Trap House podcast. Uh, this is Max. I'm a longtime listener, first-time caller. Um, I'm sure everybody's made that stupid fucking joke, but uh, what I want to know is what each of your favorite chip is. Let's say you go to the chip aisle at Kroger or, you know, the bodega or wherever. Um, what kind of chip are you getting? Let me know your, your chip of choice. Thank you. Very good question. Very good question. Yes, very good question. All right. Uh, who wants, who wants to kick this off? I'm, I'm, just, I'm thinking for a second here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple things. I have sort of, like, there, there are regional chips. And for me, like, yeah. uh, the, the, the regional chip that, you know, I grew up with and that I still love, I think it's a top-tier chip. Many people outside the New York City area do not like them. But I like the Utz chips. You Utz know, like, it I like, up. I like an Utz, like, sort of, like, like the, the ridged sour cream and onion. I will say that another chip I'm a big fan of is the Lay's sour cream and cheddar chips. That's a good chip. I will say, though, the chip that I think is... Oh, too highly rated, and I'm sort of like down on all chips of this variety. Is the kettle style chip? Ooh, shots I, fired! Yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm not really feeling them. I think they're a little too, a little too hard. You know, a little too sharp. <laughs> they cut up my soft little mouth. Um, <laughs> but then again, I used to really like Cape Cod chips. Um, but I think the Cape Cod chip quality has fallen off. I don't know. Maybe they've been bought by some European consortium. But yeah, I like, I like, you know, the classic ridged chip, but... Ridged um, chip, love it. You know, I like the, yeah, sour cream and onion, sour cream and cheddar. Like, uh, I think those are good chip varieties of, of most standard brands. Chris, what are your feelings on Grippo's, Cincinnati's own Grippo's chips? Uh, they're fine. They're very cakey. I don't like them. Yes. The uh, texture is a little difficult for me to get into, but... Yeah, eh, not a fan. Okay. Uh, I, you know what? There's a bunch I like, and I'm a big fan of certain specialty chips. Some of them are sadly no longer on the market. Like uh, Lay's did a promotion where they had a bunch of different wacky styles. They had a Euro one that was really good. They had a Korean barbecue that was great. Uh, like it, they had a, ch uh, a fried chicken and, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, biscuits and gravy. They had a biscuits and gravy chip that was fantastic. Uh, but sadly, those are all gone. U.S., we have the worst, by the way, of the Anglosphere, we have the absolute worst chip technology. How does the snack capital of the world, 
How does the gorging hole of humanity have such <laughs> meager fucking chip options? We don't even have all dressed. In Where's this our country. all dressed? Where's our Those all really dressed? Good. The, the Lay's all dressed are wonderful. And, and the ketchup, ketchup flavored chips too. Also, Canada superior, Britain superior. All the Asian countries get out of here. They got like a jamon iberico chip in fucking uh, lay in uh, Spanish Lay's for God's sake. So, I, but I would say that my war horse. The one I crave when I walk by the aisle and most likely to grab on a on an impulse, sour cream and onion Pringles. Mm, interesting. I like the Pringle. I, I know it's not technically a, a potato chip, according to English common law, but I still enjoy it a great deal. <laughs> Matt, do you, uh, do, you, do you remember when you almost made us all victims of sectarian violence in Dublin when you oh my uh, God. made fun they were of ready Mr. To, Tato? To fucking roll a car <laughs> bomb up to us. Yeah, they're breaking out the arm light. They're pulling on the balaclava. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking they love their about Tato's the, up they there. They love the Tato, of Mr. Tato. What I found out though is that there's two different ta- Mr. Yeah. Tatoes in Northern Ireland and uh, you know the Republic of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, it's amazing. They've got a fucking Protestant and a Catholic potato man. That's how <laughs> indicated. That's how dedicated they were to that project for so long. I don't really like the chips that much. Of course not. You have more of a sweet tooth, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. <sighs> to keep it in the realm of potato snacks. A potato chip is as bad for you, if not a little bit worse for you than fries. Uh, the fries are bad for you, not because they're potato, but because of the fried surface area. That's why smaller cut fries are higher in caloric, caloric content and fat than larger uh, the, the big steak fries. Yeah, surface steak area. fries. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm eating a fried potato, I'd rather have fries, which are on average about as bad for you and much more fun. And if I'm just eating something bad, I'd rather have I'd rather have um, ice cream, an ice cream, a cake, or a candy. Do you guys have any? Do you guys have any feelings strongly for or against salt and vinegar chips? That is like no, no, that, no, no. I feel like they kind of are like IPA to me. They're like the IPAs of chips. They got sucks. super hype. They became the standard, and I, I like them in certain circumstances. I think the salt and vinegar chip is an yeah. ideal chip for putting on like an Italian style hoagie for crunch. Ooh, for crunch. Uh, yeah, like you got you got some oil, and then you put salt and vinegar chips on, you know, like a like a uh, one of those uh, Jimmy John's subs with the the uh, salami and such. Now we're talking, but just to eat out of a bag, it's a little too. It's eh. a little too. Yeah, those suck. No, those um, fucking suck. Those are like something that a Scottish person would eat. Yes, very <laughs> Scottish. <laughs> well, Matt, I do, I do agree with that. That's why I like the Uts chips, baby. though, because they're they're softer. I think they're really good for adding to sandwiches, and you just press the bread yes, down. Yes, exactly. Nice crunchy, crunchy layer on that. You they possibly put up any the sandwich. sandwich and then deep fry it, laddie. What an ugly, ugly people. Oh, hideous. Very, very nice, though. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for the potato chip question, listener. All right, uh, one more question, guys. <laughs> yeah, let's let's do one more. Uh, what do you guys What do you guys like? One on college. One on future casting presidential elections or one on Berlin Techno Clubs? Uh, let's do college. College. All right. Here Animal. we go. Animal. House. 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 Here we go. All right. From listener Madeline. Hello. My question is, even though you guys are fairly anti-college, which is a, sta- a sentiment that I agree with, do you think the liberal arts are valuable to study? Um, the great books and that sort of thing, studying literature and art history. Uh, if the university is the wrong venue for that because of how what Americans have done with it or because of how it's structured nowadays, where do you think a good venue for learning that sort of stuff is and why? Okay, I have, I have, I have a thought of this. I have an idea. We need to destroy college and get rid of it. People are like, whoa, what do you replace it with? It does valuable work. I understand that some subjects are capital intensive to re- enough to require like a fixed asset to study around and you might have a few regional facilities that do that kind of advanced stuff but in my mind college classes would be free and available in the community you live in of all topics and that and that you would pick that you would educate yourself and then there would be skill trade learning as part of that and but also the uh liberal arts and every other fucking thing but there would be no colleges yeah no i uh to to madeline's point uh i'm a I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the uh, liberal arts, of the study of, you know, art, literature, history. And I don't think you can regard, I don't think you can be regarded as educated without some, some exposure to a liberal arts education. And like you can be, 
I'm not, I'm not saying like, you know, the, the, the sciences or highly skilled technical fields are uh, not worthwhile, obviously not. But there's a reason why, let's just say, most engineers and doctors are a billion times smarter than I am in many ways, but I still regard them as um, uncultured uh, dullards. I mean, I think they're, they're, gen- they're genuinely stupid people because they have an incredibly, sk- they have an incredibly highly uh, like technical skill that takes an insane amount of education and discipline to uh, get you to the point of having one skill that like only a handful of people have that's very useful to society. But essentially, that's why I don't think their opinions are valid on anything outside of brain surgery. Yeah, or, get it out of uh, here. Con- constructing a, I don't know. A, 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 you're sacrificing, uh, you, know. you, you, you have to, you have, it's a, your, your education is a D&D build. You, you know, these guys all min-maxed, as they say, and that means that their other, uh, uh, their other counters are fucking empty. And you need those. You need people I mean, with like, those counters. Have you, have you guys noticed, actually, just over this last week, um, people have been pointing at this out, particularly among crypto people, the astonishing they hostility they have to reading books. The very concept it, of reading infuriates them. Well, I mean, like, look, the proof is in the pudding. It's there. Th- this is what not reading books leads to. This is yep. what being very, very smart in, in quotation books and like looking at numbers and data and markets and all that shit. This is what it leads to. Yep is obliterating billions of dollars of wealth in um, just petty frauds and scams. If you, do not read, if you do not read literature on your own, if you do not seek out books and art that you are interested in engaging with, that like takes some, some, some mental lifting on your part to engage with, like I don't think you're an intelligent person. I don't think you should be regarded as intelligent, nor do I think you should be given any kind of real authority in our society. Absolutely. You're, uh, you're a, a fucking hunchback. You're a freak. Get out of here. You've 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 warped yourself into a mutant through through intellectual onanism. I want to say though, some people say, "Oh, if you did that, you know, you don't have that camaraderie and like coming into adulthood feeling of going to college." And yes, that's true. Uh, that's why in my fantasy world that I'm describing here, there would be national fucking service. People would have to go and work together on projects, and then they would go home, and then they could fu- study whatever the fuck they wanted. Uh, knock yourself out. <laughs> have fun get a degree i don't care uh all right let's uh let's see what today uh thanks again to our uh listener collins i do just want to say at the end of today's episode on the uh topic of uh listener engagement i would just like to uh thank everyone who uh reached out to me via email or message regarding the comments i made at the top of last monday's episode we got a lot, a lot of, a lot of reaction to that. A lot of people transcribed it and shared it, and a lot of people sent me very heartfelt emails and messages. If I didn't get a chance to um, reply to all of them personally, please know that I saw them and they meant a great deal to me. So uh, it, it means a lot to me that uh, what I said resonated so deeply with so many of you. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, reached out to me or, or or shared positive thoughts or kind words. Uh, about what I said at the top of uh, last week's show. So th- thank you for that. Uh, I would just also like to add that I think that this new uh, call-in system is working well, and uh, I think we're going to keep it rolling. So if you want to submit calls, uh, just email us at calls at chapotraphouse.com. Uh, leave a under 30-second uh, voice note or recording of any kind, and uh, we'll keep the call line open. Calls at chapotraphouse.com. 